will resume his seat, it being uh, 2 p.m. in accordance with Standing Order 43. The time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Every member of this parliament agrees that reducing the appallingly high rate of veteran suicide in Australia should be an absolute priority. We have both met with Julianne Finney, whose son David, a veteran, died earlier this year and whose petition has already attracted a quarter of a million signatures. Will the Prime Minister agree with Mrs Finney's calls, join with Labor and establish a Royal Commission into veteran suicide? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I met with uh, Julian, Julianne Finney uh, just last week uh, here in Canberra, and we had a, another very productive discussion. Her son David had died by suicide earlier this year. And I also met with uh, as many other parents uh, in Sydney recently to discuss their proposal um, for a Royal Commission to be held into veteran suicide. Um, we all know that the rate of mental illness amongst veterans is unacceptably high. Uh, the suicide rate for ex-serving men aged under 30 is 2.2 times that for Australian men of the same age, and about a third of those who have left the ADF in the past five years have reported high to very high levels of psychological distress. Uh, Mr Speaker, this has been a matter that has been made a national priority by my government as part of its broader focus on our towards zero, towards zero goal to address mental health issues and to address suicide prevention. And Christine Morgan uh, has been appointed as the National Suicide Prevention Advisor. We have held quite a number of detailed policy sessions with officials, including with the heads of the Defence Force and those directly responsible in the Department of Veterans Affairs, and have been working through the many challenges. And there are many changes, I want to stress, that are being made both in the way that the Defence Force operates and how the Department of Veterans Affairs operates. And I want to thank the Department and I want to thank the ADF for the changes that are, that are made. And I said to Julian, I said, I wish that those arrangements had been in place when her son had been in the Defence Force. I wish they had been in place for all of those Australians who have served and has passed away as a result of their own hand and have served in our Defence Forces. And the lessons are being put into place. Now, I have remained open to this question, and I remain open to this question. I am working closely with the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and I must say I am working closely with the veterans yep. uh, who are in this chamber, and I would welcome that input and feedback from veterans on the other side of the chamber. Yep. And only today I, I met with the member for Herbert and, and many of his serving friends uh, to talk about these very issues. And I have given an undertaking that we will continue to uh, reflect on these things over the break. Uh, before making a decision on this matter. But I can assure you of this. What I am seeking to do is ensure that whenever a veteran has sadly taken their life, whether in the past or sadly, I'd like to say it'll never happen again in the future, but no one can stand at this dispatch box and say that, that on every single occasion there must be justice, there must be accountability, there must be learnings and there must be change. And that's what I'm committed to, and my government. The honourable member for Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government's strong economic management is ensuring the, del the delivery of essential services for Australians, including in my electorate of Ford, that they so heavily rely upon? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Fe Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Ford for his question and the role he plays with all of the government members to ensure that we are being able to deliver on our commitments to the Australian people. And the most important one of those is the Australian people know they can trust the Liberal and Nationals with money. They know that they can trust Liberals and Nationals with money, and they certainly know, as they demonstrated at the last election, they know that Labor cannot be trusted with money, Mr Speaker. And it's because we do know how to manage money and the hard-earned uh, the hard earnings of those Australians and the taxes they pay, taxes which are a result of what we have done in this place, including the member for Ford's electorate, they are paying less tax 
and they will always pay less tax, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the Liberals and Nationals, because we believe, unlike those opposite, as was demonstrated at the last election, that we think Australians should keep more of what they earn. And what this means is our government trusts Australians to do the right thing and be able to do, make the right decisions about the money they earn, Mr. Speaker, and they trust us with the hard earnings that they have and they've provided through their taxes, because they know we will manage that well. And that's why we are bringing the budget back into surplus for the first time, as the Treasurer has said, in 12 years, Mr Speaker. Now, we are doing that at the same time, and this enables us to do it. When you Members know how to Bruce manage money, Lyons. as our government does, it means you can look the Australian people in the eye and you can say to them, we have guaranteed record schools funding on the basis of student need and we're investing $310 billion in our schools over the decade to 2029. We can guarantee the funding that will be there for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and we can guarantee that because we know how to manage money, Mr Speaker. We can guarantee record health and hospitals funding, including an extra $31 billion through the National Health Agreement and record support for mental health and suicide prevention, because we know how to manage money. And we're doing this by keeping the budget in surplus, not increasing the debt, Mr Speaker, and not increasing taxes as those of opposite member for Rankin. The member for What was Rankin. amazing, Mr Speaker, is those opposite at the last election, the Labor Party at the last election came up with $387 billion of higher taxes, and they say now that New Start should go up, but when when they were taking it to the last election, they had $387 billion of higher taxes and still couldn't make that commitment, Mr Speaker. There were no taxes high enough to satisfy the spending appetites of the Labor Party. But on our side, Mr Speaker, the bulk billing rate has now gone to 86.2 per cent, a record. There is increased investment in the pharmaceutical benefit schemes, 2,200 new and amended items, a $503 million youth mental health and suicide prevention plan, a further $496.3 million for an the additional 10,000 home has care packages. Concluded. The member for Rankin. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Given the Reserve Bank has already cut interest rates three, three times since the election to a quarter of the emergency lows during the GFC, downgraded growth three times since the budget, contemplated unconventional monetary policy, and confirmed that low wages growth under this government is the new normal, what will it take for the Morrison government to be shaken out of its complacency on this floundering economy? Yeah. The Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to tell the House that the IMF and the OECD have the Australian economy growing in 2020 faster than any G7 country, Mr Speaker. The member I'm for Rankin is now warned. That when it comes to real wages, they've been growing at 0.6 per cent, and when we came to government, they were 0.5 per cent, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to tell the House that employment growth is at 2 per cent, and when we came to government, it was around a third, Mr. Speaker, of that. And at 2 per cent, it's more than double the OECD average, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to tell the House that since we've come to government, more than 1.4 million new jobs have been created, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to tell the House that today the ABS have announced the current account surplus is the highest on record, Mr Speaker, of $7.9 billion, Mr Speaker. And that's because this Prime Minister and coalition Prime Ministers before him have entered into free trade agreements, creating some new markets for nearly two billion new customers for Australian businesses to export, Mr Speaker. So the coalition is not only cutting taxes, but it's creating jobs, while those opposite will always be the party of $387 billion of higher taxes. The member for Mallee has the call. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister outline how the Morrison-McCormack government's stable and certain budget and economic management are guaranteeing the essential services that rural and regional Australians rely on? Good question. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> didn't see you out there. Thanks to the, uh, and I didn't see any of the members for Labor out the front this morning. 
I always come up and talk to farmers because farmers are the lifeblood of this nation. They grow the food and fibre. Oh, we've, we've, we've got a bit of reaction. What are you standing the up Deputy for? Prime you don't Minister stand will up resume his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. <clears throat> The member for Hunter will resume his seat. He doesn't have the call. No, I'm not calling you. You could only raise a point of order on relevance, and I'm making a judgment. There is no point of order on relevance, unless you've got a point of order on another matter. And if people think people are surprised by that, I refer to a Harry Jenkins ruling on the same matter. Ironically. Uh, with respect to the member interjecting, the Minister for Home Affairs. <laughs> the Deputy Prime, Minister, Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Indeed, and I thank remind you. him his microphone is in perfect working order. <laughs> Indeed, it is just like the Liberal and Nationals government perfect working order. Backing workers, backing farmers, backing the uh, electorate of Mallee. That wonderful rural Victorian electorate, Mr Speaker, home to just some of the 8.8 .8 million Australians who call regional Australia home, and we are backing them too. The member for Mallee is certainly backing her community. She's out there every day of the week, fighting hard for the farmers, fighting hard for the people who want better digital connectivity. Mr Speaker, this government, this government is building the infrastructure to boost growth and to unlock the potential for families, for farmers, certainly in the member for Mallee's electorate. In the member's electorate, as well as investing in road, rail and air infrastructure, we've invested in the essential services people living in regional areas deserve. Mr Speaker, when I was in uh, Mildura during the election campaign, the Mayor of Mildura, Simon Clements, said the investment that we'd made, $2 million in the uh, in the uh, landing instrument system at the local airport was the best investment that we had ever made for his community because he knew that it was going to grow. He knew that Members it was going to grow the, uh, the aviation opportunities uh, for those communities. Mr Speaker, we've delivered $8.9 million in Mallee through the Mobile Black Spot program. 41 Mobile Black Spot towers have been funded, with 32 already installed. And I hear them cry out, they didn't deliver one. Not one mobile phone tower in six sorry years of government. And I was there for three of them. I was there for three of them. You didn't deliver one. Not one. Not a single Members one on of the fat zero zilch for you guys over there. But Mr Speaker, digital conic <laughs> Oh cut a the nerve. Deputy Prime Minister. What a will... soft touch you are. <laughs> The member for Hunter on a point of order. He's not listening to our farmers, and our farmers long ago stopped listening to him. The member for Hunter will leave under standing order 94 <laughs> Members on my right. The member for MacArthur will cease interjecting. I haven't called the Deputy Prime Minister. Well, you can resume your seat then. You can resume your seat for a second. You can resume your seat for a second. Just for the information of all members raising points of order, I'm not going to keep repeating myself. If you're seeking to raise a point of order, you need to state what the point of order is. If you seek my call to raise a point of order and then just give a speech, it's a gross misuse uh, of the standing orders, and I will treat uh, the, as I treated the member for Hunter, I'll treat anyone else raising frivolous points of order in the same way. If you can't find an opportunity to, well, <laughs> <laughs> the Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, digital connectivity <laughs> is important for regional Australia. Mr Speaker, 1,047 mobile black spot towers have either been funded or installed. 
and the 750th. No, it's not lies. It's not lies at all. It's ab the absolute truth. Funded or installed the 750th now on air in Mallee in the small town of Nullawal. Now, not a big town, but it's an important town. It punches well above its weight, just like the rest of Mallee does, providing the food and fibre that our nation needs and others need as well. Mr. Speaker, the Regional Australia Migration Package, recently announced by the Minister for Agriculture in Mildura, a $20 million package that's also going to bring benefits for Mallee, benefits for Regional the Australia. Deputy Prime Minister's time has concluded. The member for Sydney, again, set my watch by it. The member for Gordon. Thanks, um, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Given that the government has presided over the worst wages growth on record, the Reserve Bank has declared that lower wage rises have become the new normal, and the Finance Minister has said that low wages growth is a deliberate design feature of the government's economic policies. Why does the Treasurer pretend the economy, the economy is delivering for working people when plainly, plainly it isn't? The Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, the jobs numbers speak for themselves. When we came to government, unemployment was 5.7 per cent, and today it's 5.3 per cent, Mr Speaker. And we have helped create more than 1.4 million new jobs, Mr Speaker. More jobs for young people, more jobs for seniors and more jobs for women, Mr Speaker. Now, when it comes to wages, the honourable member may not have been listening, but we have seen real wages growth at 0.6 per cent. When we came to government, it was 0.5 per cent, Mr Speaker. When Labor was last in office, the real minimum wage fell in three out of six years, Mr Speaker. Since we've been in office, the real minimum wage has been up every single year, Mr Speaker. Compensation of employees, which is the wages bill for the economy, is around 5 per cent, Mr Speaker. Again, when we came to government under Labor, it was 3.5 per cent, Mr Speaker. And the employment growth is today at 2 per cent, Mr Speaker, more than double the OECD average and around three times what it was when Labor was last in office. So, Mr Speaker, we are continuing to cut taxes, invest in infrastructure, cut regulation designed to boost the Australian economy and to create more jobs. Labor's, Labor's solution is only higher taxes, reckless spending, the result of which is less jobs and lower wages. Just before I call the member for Clark, I'd like to inform the House we have present on the floor of the chamber this afternoon the Secretary of Ho Chi Minh City's Central Party Committee, Mr Nian, who is visiting Australia under the Australian Government's Special Visits Program. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you and the Ambassador and your party. The member for Clark. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, access to foreign heavy firefighting aircraft is now problematic as the northern and southern hemisphere fire seasons overlap due to climate change, while domestic resources are stretched to fight simultaneous fires across Australia. Despite this, my repeated calls for a specialised RAAF capability have been dismissed by the government every time. The reality is that aid to the civil community is an accepted use of ADF assets, and existing RAF aircraft like the C-17 Globemaster C-130 Hercules and C-27 Spartan could all deploy roll-on, roll-off tank systems for water bombing. Prime Minister, as the country deals with a shocking bushfire season, will you now direct Defence to develop a heavy firefighting aircraft capability? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his question and, and his concern about uh, all Australians uh, who have been suffering um, under these fires and their terrible losses. And I know he would join with me in thanking all of those Australians who have been out there volunteering, uh, supporting in so many ways, not just on the fire grounds themselves, um, but those who are supporting uh, back at base, those who are providing catering and support and, and so many other functions. Can I also thank all the businesses that have been supporting all of those volunteers out there uh, who have enabled them to come to the support of their fellow Australians? And can I also thank the men and women of our Australian Defence Force, who have also been very much engaged in the most recent fires that we've seen, as they always are. They form an important part of the various support and logistics and uplifts and, and other matters and, uh, that they are involved with in using their special expertise. Now, the government takes its advice 
on the matters that you've raised from the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authority's Council. Now, that represents the fire and emergency service chiefs who have told the government that engaging the ADF in support and capability enhancement uh, that would take it away from direct firefighting is supported. Now, Mr. Speaker, I will ask the, the minister responsible in this area to respond further to you on these matters. Uh, but I, I want to assure you that whatever decisions the government takes are taken on the basis of the advice of those fire chiefs. They recommend to us what assets should be used, where those assets should come from, how many there should be, and how they should be deployed. These are matters that are responded to directly by our state and territory governments, and they've been doing an extraordinary job. And I think the coordinated effort between federal, state and local agencies in these recent fires has been exemplary. And part of the reason for that has been the outstanding work done by the Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council. We will continue to take their advice and we will continue to support their recommendations. But I'll ask the Minister to the Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And I respectfully don't agree that the access to fire and heavy fighting equipment is problematic at the moment. And I say that because only in the last three weeks I wrote to AFAC, the chief counsel uh, that represents fire commissioners, and they assured me in writing that at the moment there are suitable assets. But they do make the point that if the season uh, is protracted, then we will have to be agile enough to work with them, and that, and that is a commitment that our government has given to them. They also, in that letter, also outline the fact that they are comfortable with the arrangements we currently have with the Australian Defence Force and the support that they provide, logistic support that they provide our firefighters. And in fact, I met with those former fire chiefs that raised some concerns only today, and I assured them that they should take comfort but great pride in the professional men and women who lead our fire agencies around this state and take great comfort that they are leading us through this season. The member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer explain to the House how the Morrison government's strong budgetary position enables us to deliver the essential services that Australians rely on? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policies that may undermine this approach? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Lindsay for her question and acknowledge her extensive experience in small business before she came to this place and that there are more than 70,000 taxpayers in her electorate that will get the benefit of the tax cuts that pass this parliament, as well as Mr. Speaker, more than 14,000 small businesses in the electorate of Lindsay which will be able to access the instant asset write-off. Now, Mr. Speaker, on the 2nd of April, I announced that the budget was back in the black and back on track, Mr. Speaker, without increasing taxes, Mr. Speaker. And what we have seen since the coalition have come to government is more than 1.4 million new jobs being created. Welfare dependency at a 30-year low. The biggest tax cuts in more than 20 years. And the first balanced budget in 11 years, Mr. Speaker. And today the ABS have confirmed that the current account surplus is the highest on record, Mr. Speaker, of $7.9 billion. Now, the benefit of a strong economy is that we can guarantee the essential services that Australians rely on, like fully funding the NDIS, Mr. Speaker, like increasing funding for schools and hospitals by around 60 per cent, Mr. Speaker, as well as the most recent announcement about a new aged care package, Mr. Speaker, with aged care funding also at a record level, Mr. Speaker. And we've also brought forward $3.8 billion of infrastructure spending. We've announced since the election of more than a billion dollars additional funding in drought support, Mr. Speaker, and in our drought response, um, which has been critical, Mr. Speaker. And these are all the benefits of a strong economy with responsible budget management. Now, that is in stark contrast from what those opposite have taken to the Australian people. We know that the former Labor Treasurer, the member for Lilly, Wayne Swan, promised four budget surpluses. Budget surpluses that he's still looking for, Mr. Speaker. Budget surpluses that he's member still for looking Rankin. for. And we know that those opposite enjoyed iron ore prices that are more than double what they earn today 
they are today, but they still racked up $240 billion of accumulated deficits. We member know for they Sydney, took the Australian people member for Sydney $387 board. billion of higher taxes that are still on their books, Mr Speaker. And we know that they attacked the small businesses across Australia as being from the top end of town, Mr Speaker. And those opposite attacked the millions of Australian retirees and said that they were complaining from the back of their yachts, Mr Speaker. That's how they treated retirees. That's how they treated small businesses. That's how they had treated the, job, um, the workers of Australia. Mr Speaker, only this side of the House can be relied on to deliver a stronger economy, to lower taxes and create more jobs. The member for Rankin. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's answer in question time today in which he claimed the Liberal government has not increased debt. Can the Prime Minister confirm that since coming to office the government has more than doubled Australia's debt, meaning, meaning more than half of Australia's debt is Liberal debt? Can the Prime Minister confirm he has just misled the parliament again today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Members on my left, the member for Bruce. The Treasurer. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If, uh, if the member would like to go and look at the budget that the Treasurer handed down this year, in 2019-20, it shows the budget will be in surplus for the current year. And, Mr. Speaker, and it shows on my that left. this year and over the forward estimates in the budget forecast that were provided in 2019-20 that the debt levels of net debt fall by member some $50 Gordon. billion. Dollars over those four years, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. Members will cease interjecting. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, it goes to relevance. It wasn't about forecasts. It was about this government's record of doubling the debt. That's the, what the question was. The Leader of the Opposition will re resume his seat. The Prime Minister, I believe, is, is in order. He's addressing the topic. The Prime Minister. Speaker. Now, it, it, I know for Obi Swan's Padawan over there, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> it, it, it is a complex sort of thing for him to understand. Because in the Labor Party, they haven't had a surplus since 1989. Now, when you go into surplus, it means you're able to reduce debt. That's what's happening, Mr. Speaker. What I have said is that in the 2019-20 budget. The budget is coming into surplus this year, which means that we are able to pay down debt. And in 2019-20, we did not put up taxes, Mr. Speaker. We actually delivered again generational tax relief for Australians. Now, those opposite, those opposite, Mr. Speaker, those opposite were saying very clearly at the last election that they thought the remedy to the challenges the Australian economy was facing was to load it up with $387 billion of higher taxes on the Australian people. Now, Mr Speaker, we don't share that view. We share the view that Australians should keep more of what they earn. And what I said very plainly, Mr Speaker, is in our budget we are delivering record funding for schools, record funding for hospitals, we are fully funding the NDIS, and we are doing that, Mr Speaker, in our budget without increasing the debt and we're doing it without increasing taxes and with responsible financial management. Now I understand responsible financial management is a complete mystery to those who sit on the other side. The Australian people do not trust Labor with their money. And Mr Speaker, we know that the Australian people know that when Labor run out of their own money, they come into the pockets of the Australian people. They know that Labor cannot be trusted with money, and we have demonstrated time and again that only the Liberals and Nationals can be trusted with the finances of this nation to ensure we can guarantee the essentials that Australians rely on. Labor make all sorts of promises, Member for but they write cheques that their own poor financial management can never cash. The Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer explain to the House why disciplined and responsible economic management is so important at a time of global headwinds and uncertainty? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policies that would compromise this stable and certain approach? 
The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Wentworth for his question and acknowledge his extensive experience as a leading Australian diplomat before he came into this place. And in his electorate, there are more than 80,000 taxpayers who will benefit from the tax cuts that we on this side of the House have supported, Mr Speaker. More than 30 thousand small businesses in the electorate of Wentworth will be able to access the instant asset write-off again, which we announced in this year's budget. Now, the Australian economy faces significant global and domestic headwinds, Mr Speaker. We know uh, globally, with the trade tensions, that the IMF have said that if they don't abate, next year you could see $700 billion come off global GDP, Mr Speaker. And we know in terms of the drought, the devastating drought here in Australia, that, um, that agricultural output in the last two years is down by more than 14 per cent, and that this drought is affecting around two-thirds of Queensland and about 95 per cent of New South Wales. Now, Mr Speaker, despite those economic headwinds, domestic and global, the Australian economy continues to grow. We're in our 29th consecutive year of economic growth. While Germany, the United Kingdom, South Korea all experience negative economic growth this year, the Australian economy continues to grow. We have a triple A credit rating and employment growth is around 2 per cent, which is around three times what we inherited from the Labor Party and more than double the OECD average. Mr. Speaker. And today, the current account surplus is the highest on record, Mr. Speaker, $7.9 billion. And it's through the work of this government that we are opening up access to markets for nearly two billion uh, new customers across the region as a result of the FTAs that we've entered into. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm asked about any alternative approaches. Now, we know that despite SNP saying this week that the outlook for Australia is sound, despite Deloitte's saying that the growth momentum is picking up. Despite the Reserve Bank of Australia saying the economy has reached a gentle turning point, and despite the IMF and the OECD saying that Australia next year will have faster growth than in any G7 nation, those opposite, particularly the member for Rankin and the leader of the opposition, talk down the Australian economy. Now, it's probably the first time and the last time I'll say it in this place, but the leader of the opposition should listen to Wayne Swan when he says. It's important our political leaders not be out there talking down the economy. Rentless, relentless negativity from the doomsayers insults the hard work so many Australians put in to make our economy strong. I say to the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Rankin, they should dwell on that fact when they continue to talk down the Australian economy, despite this, this side of the House and this government cutting taxes Treasures and creating more jobs. Concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he has misled this Parliament on every one of the past four sitting days? Why does the Prime Minister have a problem with the truth? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker. The assertion put forward by the Leader of the Opposition is simply not correct. It's simply not correct, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, Mem members on my left. this Opposition has shown themselves to be interested in only smearing people in this place and not engaging in the serious issues and the real issues that Australians, Mr Speaker, want this place to focus on, and our government is 100 per cent focused on. What the Leader of the Opposition has demonstrated Mr. Speaker, during his time over the last six months in this role is he has no interest in engaging on the critical issues of driving our economy forward. Mr. Mr. Speaker. He has no interest in talking about jobs. He comes into this place with his tricky little stunts and his clever little lines, Mr. Speaker, treating this parliament like some sort of second-rate high school debating changer. Engaging Mr Speaker in punctuation points and commas, extolling his great virtues apparently as the great master of parliamentary procedure. Now, Mr Speaker, if he wants to be manager of government business again in the government, well, if that's the job he's seeking, well, those sorts of pedantic points about parliamentary procedure, he can engage himself in any day of the week. If he actually wants to be a Prime Minister, he's got to deal with the real issues. Members on my left, the member for Ballarat, has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? The Prime Minister's concluded his answer. 
The members on my left, member for Barton, I fear we're about to lose you for an hour. The member for Moore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Minister for Government Services. Will the Minister outline how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget position is guaranteeing the delivery of the NDIS? The Minister for the NDIS. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member for his question and for his interest in the 666 participants in the NDIS in his electorate, noting, of course, that WA won't come into full scheme for a number of years. It's important also for the House to understand that this government is absolutely backing in Australians with disability, their families and their carers, and we are absolutely committed to making the NDIS deliver for people with disability. And we can make that commitment because of one reason and one reason only, and that's because of the strong economy and the certain budget position and the full funding of over $18 billion this year, rising to $22 billion in the coming years. Today, of course, is the International Day of People with Disability, which is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on how we can continue to improve the Member services for Wills. we provide, the Member for not Wills. just to the 500,000 Australians who will be in the NDIS over the next five years, but the 4.4 million Australians, everyday quiet Australians in our communities who live with some form of disability. As of 30 September, there are 311,000 Australians in the NDIS, and what is extraordinarily pleasing is 114,000 of Wills these Australians are receiving a service for the very first time in their life, which is extraordinary. We have seen an 11 per cent decrease in the number of younger Australians in residential aged care, a 22 per cent decrease in the month or quarter on quarter new young Australians coming into residential aged care, and a full joint agency task force has now been put onto that issue to ensure that there will be no Australians, younger Australians in residential aged care by 2025. Further improvements have also been made. Access decisions in relation to progress into the NDIS has reduced to an average of only 12 days. Similarly, first plans being approved is now 88 days compared to 133 days previously. Huge improvements have been made in younger Australians aged 0 to 6, gaining access into early childhood, early intervention. In terms of assistive technology and home modification quotations, they've reduced down to only 5,000 in terms of a waiting list, and this will be cleared by the first quarter in next year. And of course, the NDIS provider market continues to grow up 6 per cent this quarter to 13,434. The number of houses for specialist disability accommodation has increased in the last 12 months by a staggering 89 per cent, up to almost 3,500. This is what a strong economy and a strong budget position delivers. It delivers great outcomes the for Australians with disability. The minister's time has concluded. Just before I call the member for Highmarsh, I'd also like to inform the House we have present in the Speaker's Gallery this afternoon the Honourable Curtis Pitt, the Speaker of the Queensland Parliament. On behalf of the House, a very warm welcome to you. The member for Hindmarsh. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Emissions Reduction. Has the Minister been interviewed by detectives from Strike Force Garrett? The Minister for Emissions Reduction no. is the call. The member for uh, Braddon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget and economic management are helping to guarantee critical funding for our hospitals? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the member for Braddon, who has been a uh, great advocate for uh, better funding for hospitals and also for drug and alcohol services, including the six million dollars for the uh, city mi uh, mission. Uh, residential rehab service for drug and alcohol in Tasmania. In particular, though, uh, he's also advocated 
for the $20 million for elective surgery, uh, which we have now brought forward in conjunction with the Tasmanian government. Uh, the member for Braddon, the member for Bass, uh, coalition senators from Tasmania and uh, the Tasmanian Premier and the uh, Tasmanian Health Minister have all asked if we could bring forward this funding, and we have done that. What that means is that there will be 6,000 additional elective surgeries in Tasmania over the course of the coming year as a consequence of the ability to manage the budget, to therefore support those additional services and to therefore support Tasmanian patients. But these are only things you could do if you have a strong economy, if by creating trade arrangements you create additional trade, therefore you create jobs and therefore you create more income for the country and less people who are, defend, are dependent on welfare. What that means for Tasmania is that we are going from an inherited Commonwealth payment in the year before we came to government of $294 million to this year $424 million and by the end of the new, uh, the new health reform agreement $524 million a year. So that's a massive increase, which you can only do when you have a strong economy. But that increase is being played out around the country, where we are adding an extra $31 billion over the course of the next five-year agreement. And I am delighted to affirm that all states and territories have now signed the heads of agreement. Yeah. Victoria and Queensland have recently signed that heads of agreement, which I think is a breakthrough and which will be welcomed, no doubt, by all on all sides of this parliament. And very significantly, what that means is that in terms of our hospital funding, we are going from $13 billion that we inherited to almost $23 billion, $24 billion, $25 billion and $26 billion over each of the years of the forward estimates. So we're able to do that because strong fiscal management and strong microeconomic reform create the circumstances where there's confidence for businesses to invest and create jobs. The government then receives the revenue. Uh, it has less to pay out because more people are working, and therefore we're able to invest that money in more hospital services. And these things come together. It's also allowed us to invest $80 million in the Peter McCallum National Centre for Cellular Immunotherapy. And one of the things I am most pleased about is $100 million for the Sydney Comprehensive Children's Cancer Centre. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you again, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today, the Leader of the Government in the Senate refused to produce documents recording the Prime Minister's call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner on the grounds of an ongoing police investigation by Strike Force Garrett. Why won't the Prime Minister provide documents to the Parliament citing an ongoing police investigation, but is willing to background journalists to downplay the nature and the substance of that strike force? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I advise the members opposite this is question time, not smear time. Correct. That's what it is. You're supposed to ask questions, Mr Speaker, not make baseless assertions as part of partisan political games. Which Prime I think Minister, you think just, if you just pause for a second, the member for Lyons will leave Understanding Order 94A. As will others who continue to interject. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll wait for the opposition leader to finish his interjections, Mr. Speaker. If he's, that's fine. Mr. Speaker, it is the practice of governments of either persuasion to claim public immunity exemption from Senate orders for various reasons where disclosure would be contrary to the public interest. And I note that in the case of the former government, uh, they claim those matters, according to Senate StatsNet, on numerous occasions, and matters to freedom of information, the Australian road rules and Australian vehicle standards rules. They claimed it in relation to carbon permits, the Australian network on communications policies. On any number of occasions, Mr Speaker, when those opposite were in government, uh, they, uh, uh, they undertook a very similar uh, uh, response to the one that the Leader of the Government and the Senate has done on this occasion. And what this highlights is something very important, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition wants to apply standards to the Government that he's not prepared to apply to himself, Mr Speaker. He's not prepared to Member apply Isaacs. the standards that he seeks to imply on this Government that were not followed by Labor when they were in Government, Mr Speaker, and nor have they followed in opposition. 
Mr Speaker, I'm very happy for the matter which is being looked at by the New South Wales Police. They will finish their investigation, Mr Speaker, and they will report on the outcome of that. And I will consider that matter when it comes to its conclusion. But let's make something very clear. The Leader of the Opposition has set a clear principle that he believes should be followed, and that is if any member refers an member issue to any law enforcement authority and that matter is then followed up with an investigation that that member should, set us, should stand aside. That is the test that this Leader of the Opposition has set for himself. Now, Mr Speaker, in my case, I am happy for them to conclude this investigation, and I will respond once that, conclu once that conclusion has been drawn and I will report on the matters that are within my responsibility. What I want to know is if the Leader of the Opposition is prepared to come into this place and hold himself to the same standard. And if he doesn't, he's just the hypocrite people know him to be. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. It is. I ask that the Prime Minister withdraw. Yeah, no, that, is, that is a term that's... Yeah, thank you. I thank the Prime Minister. The member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's record funding for schools is underpinned by stable and certain economic management? The Minister for Education. The minister will just pause. The member for Sydney has already been warned. She will not interject again. Let's just see if you can make it to ten past three. The Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Curtin for her question? And she's got a passionate interest in education and also understands how important a stable economy is to providing record funding for schools. A record $310 billion investment in schools, an increase of 62 per cent per student record funding for government schools, record funding for Catholic schools, record funding for independent schools. As a matter of fact, our funding for state schools is growing at around 6.4 per cent, which is higher than what it is for our funding for Catholic and independent schools of 4.9 per cent. But, Mr Speaker, while providing record funding is important, we also have to make sure that that record funding turns into outcomes and results for our students. And that's where the focus of the government is at the moment. And next week I will be hosting Education Council in Alice Springs. And on the agenda will be very, very important reforms for the school sector. We want to bring in a unique student identifier number so that we can map the progress of students throughout their primary and secondary schooling. And as importantly, we want to bring in progressions on literacy and numeracy for students. Now we all know and understand how fundamental literacy and numeracy is for a student's educational outcomes. So we want to start mapping those educational outcomes so that for every year of study that a student undertakes, they progress when it comes to literacy and numeracy at least 12 months of learning, if not more. Now, this is absolutely fundamental. If we are going to improve the flatlining results of our students, then every state and territory across the country needs to get on board with these reforms. And I will be putting to the state and territory education ministers. It's time to be bold. It's time to back these reforms. Put the interests of the teachers' unions behind you and back these reforms. We need literacy and numeracy at the heart of what our students are learning. We need to be able to map the progressions that our students are getting when it comes to literacy and numeracy. It is going to be one of the most important COAG meetings of this year, and I need every state and territory minister to put their self-interest behind them to come be bold and back this agenda. The member for Hindmarsh. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Minister for Emissions Reduction told the House that his interests are declared in accordance with the rules, despite his failure to declare the partnership's 55,000 shares in a company reportedly worth $150 million. 
The minister's office has dismissed his disclosure obligations, saying, and I quote, the rules require that direct and controlling interests be disclosed. Does the Prime Minister accept this interpretation of his ministerial standards? The members on my left, the Leader of the House. Is the Leader of the House <coughs> rising on a point of order or is he answering the question? No, I'm answering the question. Answering the, question. the Leader of the House and Attorney General. Uh, yeah, the, the Leader of the House and Attorney General will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. On a point of order, except under practice that it's well established, Mr mm. Speaker, that the Prime Minister can refer to anyone who has ministerial responsibility. Mm. This question goes solely to the ministerial standards, which are entirely within the remit of the Prime Minister, not the Attorney General. That is right, but as he points out, the practice makes it very clear the Prime Minister, who, who that title obviously means he is the the minister for everything, but uh, the prime minister can refer a matter to another minister, and in this case, he's referred it not to the to the leader of the house in his capacity as attorney general. And whilst the, I can see the manager of opposition business has a, a difficulty with it, uh, according to the well-established practice, that's the way it is. So um, it might be something for uh, parliaments to consider in the future, but he's certainly entitled to do that. Prime Minister's previous answer, he did note that with respect to standards, and standards in this case that apply to disclosure on the um, ministerial and parliamentary interest register, that there seems to be one standard that the opposition applies exclusively to the government, or indeed one or two ministers in the government but doesn't apply that own standard to themselves. And in this interest, in this interest and in this um, matter, it's simply a question of the way in which traditionally members of both sides in the House have disclosed matters on the parliamentary register and to the Prime Minister as ministers. And the way in which that disclosure has always occurred is where there is a trust or where there is a um, company with interests in subsidiaries. The trust is declared, the company is declared, but those things inside the trust or the subsidiaries are declared by virtue of declaring the head company or the trust. And in fact, applying that standard or the standard that members opposite now seem to think applies or should apply, the, members the member for Spence and the member for Macon both disclosed shares in BHP, a company with interests in close to 400 subsidiaries. Now, according to the standards of the leader of the opposition, if they were to apply their own standards to their own members, they would require to list every single one of those subsidiary companies. The member for Jelly Brands has declared interest in Telstra but failed to list the subsidiaries. The member for Sydney has disclosed a family trust that holds shares but has not disclosed oh, just so the, the shares. Just the, upholds... the, the Attorney General needs to pause. The member for McMahon, member for McMahon will cease interjecting. I need the Attorney General to resume his seat for a second. I listened very carefully to the question. I had a caution about it until the very end, which was when the member for Hindmarsh said that the question uh, related to um, the ministerial standards rather than the reg register of members' interests. And what the attorney's doing is, is obviously uh, referring to the register of members' interests, but the Prime Minister has no responsibility for that whatsoever. No, the Prime Minister has no responsibility for the register of members' interests of the House of Representatives. Other, I mean, he doesn't. He can't even, you know, be questioned on it on his own. On his own, that is crystal clear. So. Uh, not only can he not be asked a question on it, uh, no one can answer such a question on his behalf. The question was about the ministerial standards. So I'm happy to call the Attorney General. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, and the, the principle that applies to the disclosure of trusts 
and those matters that sit inside the trust applies equally Members on my left. to the ministerial standards, and it always has done. And if it were not the case, we would have the member for Sydney having to disclose all of the shares that is held in the trust that she holds. Attorney General, as the Attorney General completed his answer, the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat, and I will call the member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget is guaranteeing the essential aged care services that older Australians rely on? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the member for Moncrief. And, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of her passionate areas of uh, interest and activity since coming to this place has been in terms of aged care. And she's been a great advocate for action in relation to uh, uh, chemical restraint and reducing that practice and making sure that it's never allowed to be misused or abused again in line with the views of the Royal Commission. And I thank them for their findings. And also an advocate for action and research on dementia, a condition which will increasingly affect more and more Australians as our population ages. So this is our great combined sacred trust. We are able to take steps in this direction because we do have a budget that is uh, strong, a, a budget which then allows us to move from $13 billion of funding, uh, which we inherited when we came in in the year prior to us coming to government, to now 22, 23, and 24 and 25 billion dollars approximately over the course of the forward estimates. What we said, though, only only last week, when we announced our response to the Royal Commission, was to deal with the interim priorities that were identified. And the Prime Minister himself was the person who called the Royal Commission on his watch, in his time, in a way that no other person in Australian history has done before. And he did that coming off the back of the tragedy and scandal that occurred in Oakton under the previous South Australian government in a state-run facility, but recognising that more needed to be done around the country. As a consequence of that, we have been able to invest $537 million uh, in the interim response to the, uh, to the Royal Commission. And in particular, that has included the commitment to unify, Member in line with the Royal Commission's recommendations, the home care and home support programs, to invest $496 million immediately in, ad in additional home care places, to make sure that we are focusing on the needs of higher level patients, of those residents who are, uh, those older Australians who need that support. In addition to that, though, it is about bringing younger Australians who are in aged care facilities out of those facilities. We have accepted the Royal Commission's goals of taking all those Australians under the age of 45 out, Member for of, MacArthur. out of facilities by 2022, subject to some exceptions, and similarly under 65 out of facilities by 2025. In particular, though, we have accepted the need to do more to prevent chemical restraint of patients with dementia. That is why we have uh, taken steps so as of the 1st of January. Respiridone will not be available for more than a 12-week period without a special authorisation. This is about ending that the practice of time abuse has concluded. of the minister's time has concluded. The manager of opposition business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the minister for emissions reduction. Yesterday, the minister's office provided a response to claims that he's been misleading the parliament ever since his first speech, when he claimed that Naomi Wolf was living a few doors down the corridor when, in fact, she was on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Given that the minister's been misleading the parliament since the day he arrived, is he proud of his consistency that he has continued his career as he began it? Uh, the I'm, no, I'm just going to, be, I'm going to be ruthlessly efficient here. The Leader of the House can resume his seat. I'm just going to call the next question. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Women. Will the minister outline how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget is delivering critical funding to help address the issue of family and domestic violence? 
the Minister for the Environment and the Minister representing the Minister for Women. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Boothby for her question, for her keen interest in women's issues and the support she provides to services in her electorate that in turn support women and families, including Marion Life and Uniting Care Wesley Bowden, who both do such important work. Uh, Mr Speaker, because of our careful management of the economy, the Morrison government is able to make the single largest Commonwealth investment of $340 million to support the fourth action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children. This investment is improving frontline services to keep women safe, to provide safe places for women who are escaping violence and to support prevention strategies to end violence against women. And this is a significant <coughs> achievement, one I know that is supported by all members of the House. Expanded services under the government's investment of the Fourth Action Plan will in particular provide increased services to children who either experience or witness violence along with their families. These specialist family violence services provide support to children, individuals and families. It's important to note that funded services do not require women to leave or stay in a violent relationship, nor do they force or promote couples counselling. All services funded under these programs must apply robust, safe planning risk, risk management principles. Um, Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister said a couple of weeks ago in talking about this incredibly important issue, the numbers are damning, but they aren't just numbers, they're people. They're girls, they're women, they're daughters, sisters, aunties, mums and grandmums. When you think about it in that context, it's hard to think about anything else. It's so important that we look at prevention, we look at addressing the issue and we look as we talk about the safe places. And our Stop It at the Start campaign, the National Primary Prevention Campaign, is yielding really positive results. It's exceeding expectations. The television commercials have been viewed over 45 million times. The website received 1.3 million page reviews and so on. It's not about hits on a website. It's about changing behaviour. And we already have evidence that that behaviour change is happening and 42 per cent of all people in a position of influence took action as a result of that campaign. Responsible economic management and surplus budgets will ensure that the priority we all in this place give to supporting women experiencing and escaping domestic violence, that priority continues to be well funded and indeed, as we've been able to do, increase the funding towards it an important national priority for information, support and counselling. Please phone, if you need to, 1800 RESPECT. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Attorney-General. Malcolm Turnbull, the former anti-corruption commissioner David Ipp QC and former counsel assisting the Independent Commission Against Corruption, Geoffrey Watson, SC, have all said the call from the Prime Minister and the Attorney-General to the New South Wales Police Commissioner about the instigation, nature and substance of the criminal investigation into the Minister for Emissions Reduction was inappropriate. Does the Attorney-General now accept that call should not have been made? The Attorney-General. Is, is that the same Geoffrey Watson who asked and made an inappropriate statement in questioning in New South Wales ICAC? Is that the one? Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? It's a question of judgment, and Mr Watson's judgment is incorrect. In fact, uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, Shadow Attorney General, your judgment has been fairly poor on these sort of matters, I'd have to say. Um, oh, the score is 8 0. 8 0. 8 0. So, if we're talking about judgment in these sort of matters, if we're talking about judgment in these sort of matters, the member for I, um, I had a very interesting occasion to quickly read through the legal profession uniform conduct barristers rules, which apply, of course, to someone in your eminent circumstances, being a Queen's Counsel. QC, by the way, doesn't stand for quality control no, in this particular no, instance. No, in this case. But it does say that a barrister must not engage, not allege any matter of fact amounting to criminality, fraud or other serious misconduct against any person unless the barrister believes on reasonable grounds that available material by which the allegation could be supported provides a proper basis for it and the client wishes the allegation to be made. Now, it would be, you would think, the case that if you referred eight matters off and zero of them resulted in anything at all, that that would indicate 
a lack of material providing a proper basis for it. So this is about judgment. The judgment that uh, was exercised quite properly by the Prime Minister was that the call was perfectly appropriate. He informed the House he was going to make it. He informed the House that it was made. The judgment of the police commissioner, who was at the other end of the call, was that it was appropriate. My judgment is that it was appropriate. What you have determined is that you don't think it's appropriate. Your judgment is just simply awful, <laughs> absolutely awful. And I know that you're very interested in the next time that you might be able to exercise your judgment, perhaps as a judge on a court of appeal. The Attorney General will resume his seat. Members on my right, the Leader of the Opposition on the point of order. My point of order is I'm concerned that the uh, Attorney General is attacking the chair in the way that he's addressing his remarks, not through the chair. The Leader of the Opposition is technically correct. Uh, I point out to the Attorney General, but the Chair hasn't taken offence, so the Attorney General has the call. When we were talking about the leader, uh, uh, the Shadow Attorney General, he was down on his phone, and I've worked out what website he was looking at. It was seek.com, <laughs> looking for the next job. And you can see the advertisement he's looking at. Court of Appeal judges wanted. Must have sizeable ego. I'm just saying. Upholding the, high standards the of The Attorney Council. General is now straying, straying from the question. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, having the Shadow Attorney General, after having exercised appalling judgment in eight matters, in eight matters, come to this box and question the judgment of people who actually exercise it in a reserved and cautious fashion, and perhaps finally, appointment of senior counsel in Victoria, they must be worthy of confidence and implicit trust by their colleagues at all times. I can tell you what, it's very hard for your colleagues to trust you when you refer eight of them for criminal investigation with zero evidence, zero result, zero judgment. The member for Barara has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget and economic management are guaranteeing critical investment in mental health services? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to. The Minister for Health has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Barara for a question about mental health. He has told this House about one of the greatest agonies that any family <coughs> could face, and he did that with immense courage, immense honesty, and in a way which has changed this House and this parliament for the better. He is not alone in the courage with which he has talked about these circumstances. He has joined uh, with the member for Eden Monaro, who has known too many veterans who have lost their lives, uh, in raising the issue of suicide and mental health. So in doing that, he has done all of us a great service. It's our privilege to be able to invest and to support and to develop the capacity of uh, the government and the Australian people to provide better mental health services and to receive better mental health services. As a government, this year uh, we will be providing over $5.2 billion of funding for mental health services, and in particular the Treasurer and the Prime Minister, because of the circumstances, have been able to allow us to invest in the largest youth mental health and suicide prevention package uh, on record. That's an over $700 million package with over $500 million specifically for uh, youth mental health and suicide prevention. That includes the expansion of headspace. It includes the increase of services at existing headspaces. It includes, in particular, support of $15 million for Indigenous services. And it's allowed us to support groups as, such as Batir mm. uh, with their work yeah, in schools. The Prime Minister and I had the uh, privilege of joining the member for Reid mm. at seeing the way they were able to work with uh, uh, young women in the later years of their school, giving, uh, giving them confidence and giving them an understanding that it's OK <coughs> to reach out. Tomorrow, in exactly that vein, a series of groups which have been supported by the government, including Beyond Blue with $37 million and Lifeline with $33 million, are launching the You Can Talk campaign. It in many ways parallels and complements what's being done with Are You OK, where each of us 
reaches out to someone else if we believe that they are at risk of a serious mental health problem or, or worse. Uh, the You Can Talk campaign says to any of us that we can reach out ourselves, that you can talk uh, as an individual. You can seek that help. There is no shame. There should be no barrier. It is a hard step. We know that it is a hard step for people to seek that help, but precisely because of the courage of people such as the member for Barara, the You Can Talk campaign speaks to Australians of all ages in all places and says to them there is help, there is no shame, it's our great obligation as a nation to look out for each other and now is the moment that we do it. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Attorney-General. Why is it that when it comes to a criminal investigation into one of his own ministers, the Attorney-General has publicly dismissed the investigation, but when it comes to the criminal investigation of journalists, he sits back and does nothing? The Leader of the House and Attorney-General. Ridiculous and, and ironically, of course, who was it? who wrote to the Prime Minister seeking the investigation into the matter pursuant to which a warrant was issued at a journalist? Who was it? The shadow attorney? But you could basically, you could basically ask the question, who was it who referred it? And one out of three times it's the shadow attorney general. I mean, and of course we've noted eight from zero. Do you know that the, the absolute Member world Lawler. record of number of test ducks in a row is five? <laughs> eight. Eight ducks in a row. But he's still batting on the team and he shouldn't be. <laughs> the member for Canning. Because my question is to the Minister for Veterans and Defence Personnel. Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain budget and economic management are guaranteeing investment in veterans' mental health and support? Great question. Minister for Defence Personnel and Veterans Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do thank the member for Canning for his question, and I note his service to our nation, and I. I say, Mr Speaker, this government is absolutely committed to putting veterans and their families first. And Australians have every right, every right to be proud of the fact that more than $11 billion of taxpayers' money is provided every year to support veterans and their families in our community. And it is because, Mr Speaker, of the strong budget position, we've been in a position to fund new measures in this term of government. As a matter of interest, Mr Speaker, there's $230 million provided per year specifically to support veterans' mental health and wellbeing measures. And over the three, last three budgets, been, there's been $500 million in additional funding to support the Department of Veterans Affairs in its transformation work. And as the Prime Minister indicated in his, quest, in his question and his answer earlier this, this afternoon, Mr Speaker, the government is listening. We do understand the concerns that are being expressed by our veteran community and the families that support them when it comes to matters of suicide prevention. And just like the Prime Minister, I have met uh, with family members directly impacted by mental Ill illness. I know some members opposite have also met with members of the defence community who have been impacted by uh, suicide and, and mental, mental wellbeing concerns. And as a minister, uh, as a government, and I'm sure as a parliament, we all agree the only acceptable number for us all when it comes to veteran suicide and Australian Defence Force personnel, the only acceptable number for us all is zero. Now the Prime Minister has made it very clear that all options are on the table when it comes to additional measures that may be required by this government. And I support the Prime Minister in his assessment. I also want to associate myself with his answer from question time earlier today. Good government requires consideration of all the options, and then we make decisions, and it's the long-term interests of veterans and their families. And I would suggest, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister's action in considering all the options is the right approach in working in the long-term interests of all veterans and their families. And I want to reassure those veterans today who may be listening. Uh, who may have some concerns about their own mental wellbeing or the families which support them, that help is available through open arms. Help is available through the Open Arms Free Counselling Service on 1800 011046. That help is available and action is being taken right now by this government. Just this week we announced some additional uh, peers to support in suicide prevention. So uh, veterans with their own lived experience working across our nation following a successful trial in the member for Herbert seat. We've announced in this term free mental health support for all veterans, anyone with a single day of service in the ADF. We are providing for a new veteran payment for vulnerable veterans and their families, and for the first time the Department of Veterans Affairs is providing for the purchase of psychiatric assistance dogs to support veterans in their mental health. So I would say, Mr Speaker, that uh, support is available, and I encourage veterans to reach out and seek that support. Finally, Mr Speaker, can I say a special thank you to the team at DVA 
to the Secretary of my department, Liz Cosson, and her hard-working team, to the Open Arms Councillors who are at the front line every day in this difficult fight, and to the thousands of volunteers and the veterans who are helping their mates struggling with mental health issues every day. By working together, Mr Speaker, I believe we can do better and we will do better. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on those.